So for those who don't know me, I'm Peter Papic from the University of Leuven, and as usual, I'm going for the longest title of the seminar or conference. It's the internal rotation profile of a gravity mode B star pulsator in the Kepler field, or the ups and downs in the forward modeling of 19 quasi equally spaced rotational split dipole modes. I'm actually very, very glad that my talk is after Don, because he already told you everything you need to know to understand what I will present. And I'm just going a bit uh, towards higher masses from Don's A star to a B star, but you will see that there are many similarities. Just to quickly sum up, our goal is to calibrate the stellar structure and evolution models, because these models are cornerstones in many fields of stellar astrophysics. Now we are looking at massive stars, which have a convective core and a radiative envelope. And thus, these stars have important, in, important internal mixing processes working inside, such as core overshooting or internal differential rotation. And although these effects have a large effect on the stellar lifetime, we have still many, many uncertainties. For example, as Don already showed one result for the internal rotation rate, where we had basically two points along the radius to put constraints on this rotation profile, we have basically three stars with some constraints of course, very limited constraints, and only 12 stars where we could put some constraints on the overshooting parameter. I will talk about a slowly pulsating B star, which can be found here in the JCD diagram. And uh, these stars pulsate in high order gravity modes, which show period spacing, which we have already heard about. And I have a sample of eight uh, B type stars in a Kepler Geo sample. And two of these stars were binaries. I have already analyzed them and published the results last year. And uh, this year, I started to work on the single stars and started with the slowest rotating single star. So it's also similar in that way to uh, Don star. It's the star on top. And you will see more in detail later. And one more important thing is that all these stars have quite a nice spread over the SPB instability strip, and they go from a V sine of 6 till up to 230. So we can also study the effects of rotation by looking through this sample. We have uh, fundamental parameters from uh, spectroscopy. We have taken follow-up observations with the ISIS on the WHT in the, on the Canary Islands. And we have done a spectral synthesis to recover the fundamental parameters. You can see the original spectrum in blue and our best fit model in red. You can already see that the star is a very slow rotator as the spectral lines are very narrow. So we derived that this star is one of the coolest SPBs studied so far. It's very near the cool edge of the instability strip. I've also plotted the two pulsating primary stars from our Kepler Geo sample and a few stars in blue from Coro to show you that stars which are studied from space with space-based photometry and which have been analyzed in detail so far don't really provide a complete coverage for the instability strip. So we need more of these detailed studies to, to study the effects which we can see throughout the instability strip. So the temperature is around 11,500 uh, Kelvins, log G is 4.1. And then we can go forward to the photometry, we have analyzed all the 17 quarters of long cadence Kepler data, which adds up to the four years with 91% of duty cycle. You can see the light curve on the left and the periodogram on the right in pieces. You can see that most of the power is concentrated in a typical G mode regime between around 0.4 and 1.1 cycles per day. At higher frequencies, you can see many combination frequencies. But unlike in Don's case, which was a nice hybrid star, we don't see P modes, so this is not helpful, unlucky in our case. But you will see when you zoom into the G mode region that you can actually find 19 consecutive rotational split G modes with nearly equal period spacing. So you can see these modes plotted against the period here in a logarithmic scale, so you see the smaller ones too. You see the period spacing function plotted here at the bottom, and also you see these rotation and split uh, components on the right side. And as a comparison, I show the window function of the data, so you can see that these triplets are nicely split, although even more narrowly split than in Don star. I'm sorry that I'm always comparing to your case, Don, but it's uh, such a handy comparison that I cannot not make it. All right, so one significant difference is that uh, we see that there is a, ah, one more thing, that 
for Tim, I also plotted an SL diagram because I noticed that many people like SL diagrams here. So it was a last minute uh, put in. You can see if you put the SL diagram that you see the, the triplet components along the period or frequency as you prefer. And of course you see this false trend because the modulo is in periods and of course the splittings in frequencies, but Tim has shown this already. But what's more interesting is actually if you go back to frequency for the frequency splittings, you still see a trend in the splittings, which means that towards higher periods, the frequency splittings are also getting larger. And we already at this point, we thought that this points toward the non-rigid internal rotation profile, but we will come back to this later in more detail. And since we have seen these triplets, we know we are dealing with dipole mode, so we have uh, mode identification information in our hands. And actually, this is the first time in the history of faster seismology, if I can say, that we can attempt an actual seismic modeling for an STB star. And that's what we do, and we follow the forward modeling method. We have had our observations, the ground-based spectroscopy, the space-based photometry. We have analyzed this data to recover the fundamental parameters and assemble, an observed, uh, uh, assemble a list of observed pulsation modes. And now what we want to do is to take a region around the spectroscopic PF and log G and calculate many theoretical models with uh, different uh, metallicities and core overshoot parameters and to see how these match our observations. So for a set of four different parameters, the mass, the central hydrogen content, or, or H, or the metallicity and the overshooting, we calculate stellar evolution, with the MESA stellar evolution code, we calculate stellar models. And here I have to mention that our first approach is assuming a fully mixed core overshooting region. And then for these stellar models with a gyro pulsation code, we calculate a list of theoretical pulsation models, modes, sorry. And then by calculating a reduced chi square, we, we compare these theoretical models, theoretical modes, to the observed modes, and then we hope to find a good match and hope to be able to put some constraints on the physical uh, parameters inside the star. What we find, first of all, on the top right, you can see the limits and the resolution of our grid. We have calculated more than 1,000, uh, almost 1,100 evolutionary tracks along this small region on the HR diagram with a resolution which ends up with 330,000 model points. So the resolution in age or central hydrogen fraction is really, really high, but this is necessary because there are small smooth changes in the frequencies and with the precision of, Kep of the Kepler mission, we are able to resolve these small differences, so we need a high resolution grid. And when we sample this high resolution grid, we can see here in this figure, sorry, it's a bit complicated, but you have to stick with me, that the best fits, so the darkest colors, because the color here is chi square logarithmic on, on logarithmic scale, so the best fits are in a very narrow range, range on the HR diagram with the best fit model here at a very young age. So the star is young. You can see that we can constrain the age or XE very well. Also, the radius is very well constrained, but you can see that other parameters are not as well constrained. And what's the reason? The reason why these parameters are not as well constrained is that there are many correlations between pairs of parameters in this parameter quadruplet. So the four parameters, there are many correlations between pairs of parameters. And also at this young age, the overshooting has a little impact on the shape of this period, period spacing function. For the correlations, I can show you just one example to help you understand these figures. Here, this plot shows you the correlation between the overshooting parameter and the Z when the other two parameters are fixed to the best fit position. So you can see that without putting better constraints on metallicity, it's not possible to constrain the overshooting better. Although if you would be able to put better constraints on metallicity, there, was even, there would be still another correlation between XC and the overshooting. So this means that there are some parameters which are not as easy to constrain. But still, in a more clear picture, here are the best five best fitting models. And uh, in summary, that the, young, the star is young with an XC over 0 0.64 and the overshooting uh, less than or equal to 0 0.15. From the average value of the splittings, we also uh, deduce an average rotation period of 188 days, but I will refine this later. And I also show the three best fit models. I don't know how much it's visible, it's quite visible that the frequencies, the theoretical frequencies are blue crosses and the observed frequencies are red dots, while in the bottom, 
you see the observed period spacing with this uh, error, red dots with the red error bars, and the theoretical period spacing function with the blue line. On the right side, you see the frequency evolution of the dipole modes. So these colorful waves are the dipole modes as they evolve as XC drops in the core and the different periods. And you see that our best fit model sits here. And you see that also that the resolution in our grid is quite large and samples this changes very well. Uh, we also have done a non adiabatic uh, stability analysis with Gyra to show you that although these excitation calculations are not really the most trustworthy at this point, but at least for these best models, we get excitation in the frequency region where we observe these modes. So this is, in any case, reassuring. And now, after we have identified these best matches and we found the modes and we, we found the models which match our observations well, we also have done an inversion of these 19 rotation and split dipole modes, starting from the kernels of these five best models. And what we find is that independently of the, this chosen one to fifth best model or the radial grid resolution or the smoothing parameters, so independent of all parameters in the inversion, we find a counter rotation in the stellar envelope with omega core over omega surface of minus 0 0.53. So here you can see over the radius of the star that there is a slowly rotating core. And then as we go towards the envelope, the rotation the direction of the rotation changes, and there is actually, again, a faster envelope rotation than core rotation, also in the case of this star. And I've already actually put here what we were discussing in the previous uh, question section, that uh, it's indeed consistent with recent, recent numerical simulations that internal gravity waves can transport angular momentum, leading to such a slowly rotating core and a counter-rotating outer radiative envelope. And actually, I also put here that this could explain Dawn's star as well. I was quite expecting this to happen. So this is actually the, the main result of this paper, that we managed to even invert these frequencies to get, to get the rotation profile through the star. And then a few words on the future, because I still have two and a half minutes. We are at the moment also looking at effects of extra mixing. So there is a paper which is in preparation and we'll, which will deal with this. And then later also we will have to deal with the magnetic fields, uh, higher order effects of rotation and with these issues I've mentioned with the excitation. And then again, there will be B stars in the field of K2, especially in field zero already, there are hundreds of candidate B star pulsators and hopefully there will be indeed at least tens if not hundreds of pulsating V-type stars because unlike lower mass stars, then we also have this problem that we don't have 10,000s or thousands of stars, but we have tens of stars. So it's a bit difficult to go towards a more ensemble study. And also with K2, we will have a problem that although it will provide more stars, there will be a limited frequency resolution. So we won't really hope to find the rotational split components, only these period spacings. But as you can see here on the right, this period spacing, in our case, the star is young, so there is not much modulation in the period spacing function. But as the star evolves, these modulations you can observe through the period spacing function uh, contain a lot of information about the physical properties inside the star. So already, if from the K2 data, and we will, based on my simulations, be able to find these frequencies also from K2 data for a more massive part of the B stars, then we can at least derive the overshooting parameter, hopefully. And then uh, for the questions, I will leave my conclusions up. So basically with kick 10, 52, 62, 94, for number, we have delivered a new SPB pulsator. We have derived the fundamental parameters from follow-up spectroscopy. We have found a series of 19 consecutive dipole modes, which are nearly equal, equ equally spaced in period. Each of these dipole modes shown very narrow rotation and split components. The amount of splitting is systematically higher towards longer periods, which already points towards a non-rigid internal rotation profile. We have done forward modeling of the star, which constrained the central hydrogen factor to be over 0 0.64, so the star is very young. The core overshooting parameter is constrained to be less than or equal to 0 0.15. In overall, this is the third detection of a series of quasi-equally spaced gravity modes in a main sequence B-type star 
after the growth at all 2010 and myself at all 2012. And this is the first actual seismic modeling of an SPP star. And from the frequency inversion, we find the counter rotation in the envelope. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, this star is in the same position, at the same position in the HR, di HR diagram than uh, Mercury Mangane stars. And uh, it is a slow rotator, so uh, I, would, I would like to know if you have any idea about abundances of metals inside. The problem is that we have, oh, sorry. So the problem is that actually the spectra I showed you is all the spectroscopy we have about the star. The star is 13th magnitude. So already we needed almost a half hour exposure to get one spectra with a signal of 70 on the William Herschel telescope. So, and also with the ESIS, we only have actually these two wavelength ranges. So it's not an actual spectrograph. We have only these two wavelength ranges. So it's very difficult to get abundances out. Actually in my table, there is a metallicity value, but as you see, it's plus minus 0 0.013, 0 0.007. So we cannot really get abundances. And for a 13th magnitude star, it's very difficult. Okay, Tim? Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. Um, the period, period spacing modulation, you compared the model with the data, and it looked to me like the model was flat, but the data had real yes, wiggles in it. Yes, but this is true. But the why this is true is that if you look at this plot where I haven't zoomed in to show these modulations, which are we are quite convinced that these are not modulations in terms of what we have in the models. So for in terms of the models, this is actually flat. Because the modulations, if I would show the, the same modulations, the same uh, size of the modulations on this, on this scale, which I've shown in the last figure when I talked about the modulations, they would go until this level. So basically, till the bottom of this figure. So we cannot reproduce this tiny, tiny modulations, but you can also just look at my one sigma error bars. Basically, the modulations are with, within the one sigma error bars. But it's a very valid question. OK, Jan? The, these are absolutely fantastic results. And, and uh, I'm very happy to see the SPP stars finally being properly analyzed. But I'm also a little bit worried about the counter rotating surface layers. And so uh, it would be very nice to see in, in your paper more details about the inversion procedures and things like the averaging kernel to see how well results yes. this so, really is. So the inversion will be presented in the second paper of the series, and Good. that's already yeah. also submitted. And, and uh, the, the question there is whether you try to constrain the rotation to be a one sign, and whether that really would be inconsistent with the data. So that, that's, that's one question. The second question to the theoreticians is the, uh, how long it would take to set up a rotation profile like that compared with a young age of a star. These are rapidly yes. evolving stars, so there's not that much time to get something strange going like this. Yes. Is there any theoretician who want to have a go at that? Stefan? Yeah, just. Just a comment and a, a quick answer to the comment of uh, Jorn about this counter-rotation counter rota in the envelope. In fact, the processes we cited before the internal waves are able to create such type of shear layer in one sense and in the opposite way. We have this situation on the Earth at the bottom of the stratosphere with what we call the shear layer oscillation. And it could be that we have the signature of such type of processes. In the Earth's atmosphere, this dynamic, these processes take time on dynamical time scales. So, so that could be interesting is to reobserve the star if possible or other, or if we can do some follow-up of such type of star when we obtain such uh, processes. 